Welcome to Genesis Marks the Spot, where we raid the ivory tower of biblical theology without ransacking our faith. My name is Carrie Griffel, and in this episode, we are going to be getting back into our imaging series. I once again have Joshua Sherman with me here to talk about this topic, and we are going to be getting into the biblical passages of how we see imaging in the Bible. So I hope you are going to really enjoy this episode. Thanks, Joshua, for joining me again to talk about the image of God. Last conversation, there were certain promises dropped to show (laughs) where and how we can see imaging language all throughout scripture, and that this is a very, very deeply embedded biblical topic. Yeah, and I suppose it's time to to pull the Jerry Maguire and and show the money, if you will. <laughs> so it, it, this will be a, be a fun conversation. There's so much to dig into, and a lot of it is really obvious once you kind of see the pattern. But it's also something you can kind of oversell, right? So mm. what what I want to do in this conversation is take a look at these different details that kind of pop up and say, we're going to look for these things and we're going to find them. And then we're going to ask, does that really fit this pattern, right? So it's not saying everywhere you see any little detail like this, that automatically means that this is what the author meant, right? It's not. That's not how language works, frankly. And metaphors can be mixed in various ways and and so can stories and details. And that's where you get into trouble with proof texting and word studies when you think everything always means the same thing and everything's always totally connected and whatever. But as we look at this, when we start to see the details that we're going to talk about pop up in other places, I think what we'll see is there are a lot of places where it does pop up in ways that are relevant to the image of God. And that's going to start to connect a lot more things and it gets really fun and exciting. Yeah. As a reminder to people, or if you haven't listened to previous episodes about the image of God that we have been doing together, we have been really digging into the embodied image of God, what that means to be the embodied image. So we're both talking about physicality as well as talking about how the image actually plays out in our lives, what it means and whether or not we see evidence of it and what that evidence might look like. And connected to the ancient Near Eastern context of the image of God, we have to get into the topic of idols and what idols are, what idolatry might be, how the Bible talks about it, and how the people of the Bible would have interacted with this topic. Yeah. So, I mean, really, if you <laughs> if you haven't listened to this series, it's probably a good one to start at the beginning because this will be very interesting, but there are, there are some points of connection and some things where you're going to be like, where did you get that from? Well, we, we talked about it. <laughs> so definitely yeah. a good one to go back and look. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're trying to do it where it, we're really looking very closely at it from our modern perspective, but also trying to dig very deeply into what that ancient perspective was and how those two things connect. Last time we talked about the image being a thing or an ontological way of looking at humanity, meaning that it is a noun. but I think what Joshua and I are kind of paralleling our thoughts on is that we can't really seem to divorce ontology and being with function and the verb of imaging God. Like that doesn't mean that there is some way of not being the image of God or that it is something that we can take away or lose because it's not because it is embedded into our very being. So it's kind of a difficult conversation to have because verbs and nouns are not the same thing. And yet you can't really have one without the other, right? Like saying that the image of God is a verb doesn't mean that there is a particular set of things you have to do in order to image God. It doesn't mean that there is a hierarchy or ratio of proportion that you can have the image of God in. So Mm -hmm. none of that is what we're saying here. But at the same time, it's like, it's like you, you can't be 90% of a cat if you act (laughs) like a cat, right? 
So you you can't be 90% of the image of God by acting according to God's will better or or something like that, right? Yeah. We are all the image. Every person who has ever been born, every person who has ever been conceived, humanity is the image of God and nothing and no one can take that away from us. I think maybe a good analogy for it would be to ask somebody what it takes to be one of your kids. If someone walked up to you and they started telling you that your kid is not your kid because they're not doing certain things that you might want them to do or expect them to do, you're going to look at them and you're first of all going to be like, you're wrong. (laughs) (laughs) And then you're also going to be like, and I don't see why you think you have a valid opinion about this. It's my child. I know. Right. And so there's a little bit of that same dynamic. I feel like when you start getting people asking questions about, well, is this person in the image of God is a person that does this or does that in the image of God. And it's like, no, like God decided we are his imagers. So we don't really get a say. (laughs) (laughs) And all the interlopers that want to start coming in and asking these questions and telling God, well, this is what it takes to be one of your imagers. Like, he's like, no, like I already decided this. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) This is it's the status of like humanity. It's a done deal. Leave it alone. <laughs> right. So, but I, I do think we can talk about some level of, do we see people being more or less able to properly image God? And I don't mean that in the way that most of the time that conversation is going to go. Right. So usually what you're going to get with Mm -hmm. something like that is people will think, well, you know, maybe this person has a body that's not functioning exactly the way that we think is normal, quote unquote, whatever that is. Or maybe their mind doesn't function quite the same. And if we have in our heads this idea that those things are the things that make up the image of God, then that person would then be more or less in the image of God than somebody else. This is entirely not what I'm talking about. And I understand entirely why careful people that are looking at ethics, both in philosophy and theology, like people like Carmen Imes, who wrote Being God's Image, why she hesitates at that and says, no, that's not how this works. (laughs) But I'm going to take a different angle on this and look at it and say, in scripture, do we see things that seem to indicate that people are better prepared or less prepared, better able or less able in a relational sense, in terms of like how they're relating to God? and then able to do what they're supposed to do in a functional sense of doing the thing. Uh, So there's a lot of stuff kind of wrapped up in that. One of the things we talked about last time with idolatry is saying, well, yes, we do see this. And one of the ways that we see it is that idols are very clearly denounced as being worthless and not being able to do what they claim to do. And that people that worship idols become like them. So that's one way. We also see this in Romans where Paul spends the first chapter basically saying, here's what happened with humanity, especially the Gentiles, as they devolved into idolatry, and here's how that messed up their being able to properly image God. And then spends chapter two saying, you think you're better as a Jew? Well, you're wrong, and here's why. And then gets into chapter three, and we get into that famous verse where he says, all of sin didn't fall in short of the glory of God. And you look at that and you go, you know, it's like, oh, what did he mean? And people focus on sin. They focus on this idea almost like it's like, you didn't meet a perfect standard, boo. Right? Hmm. As if like the perfect standard is the point. And what we see in this conversation when we bring in glory and image is that the point is that you were made to image God. And when you sin and fall short, you're not doing that well because glory is an integral part of imaging God well, of displaying his likeness, of ordering creation around you, of functioning the way you're supposed to as a child of God and co-heir and all of these kinds of things. And so it's important. And that's why sin is bad. And that's why idolatry is bad, because they pull us away from what we were designed for. I mean, if we take John Walton's framework of functional identity and creation, and nothing just exists without a function. So there's a very interconnectedness with ontology and function in that. And it's not really to say that it's about doing something well. It's about acting within the order that God has structured Mm -hmm. within creation. And as far as humanity goes, that means that we are to represent him on earth. So when you're not then that doesn't mean you're not an imager. You're just a bad imager. <laughs> like, 
you're, you're introducing chaos into yeah. the system. Yeah. And you can look at this kind of similarly asking the question about what it means to be a child of the devil, for instance, right? And people will talk mm -hmm. about things like the serpent seed, right? And, you know, are you truly just the seed of the serpent and there's nothing you can do and blah, blah, blah. That's just not the level that we're talking about things on because everybody being made in the image of God means there is no ontological serpent seed, at least not when it comes to humanity. But we do see right. people that do the deeds of demons, do the deeds of serpents, and doing that is not imaging God well, right? So we do have a sense of you are made to do this and you're not doing it well, and that actually makes it worse. And we talked about that too. Like it, it's it makes it worse that you are an imager that's not doing what you're supposed to be doing than if you were to somehow lose the image entirely and just be like, well, you know, Johnny went off and, and he's not that anymore. And so, you know, he's just going to do his thing and whatever. But it's like, no, every single time you're doing these things, you are an imager that's doing these things and that's bad, right? So it does add a lot of weight to what it means to be human, it has a lot of importance to what it means to be human and our relationship with God and those around us. This is also the theme that we see in Genesis, where human depravity just grows and grows and grows through the, the first five chapters until we get mm -hmm. to the point of the flood. Yeah. Part of the, the issue I have with the usual way of understanding something like total depravity is that that framework is usually understood as the fall done mm, right right and right. and genesis definitely has like this whole slide and and you can actually see that even in the way that paul looks at things in romans one he starts to talk about it and he's like for although they knew god so they know god right okay they neither glorified him as god nor gave thanks to him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. That's not talking about Adam and Eve, right? Because we don't see them mm -hmm. exchanging for yeah. the images of other creatures. We do see that later on in scripture. One of the other points of connectivity with this, if we want to talk about kind of the practicality side of it, a plug for Matthew Bates' books on this. He has a couple of books on the gospel that are really good, and he ties into the image of God and glory and how this kind of interacts. And he talks about this kind of glory cycle, if you will, that part of the problem that we are facing is not just sin, but it's actually the lack of glory because humanity is not fulfilling the function we were created for. And we're meant to be kind of pivotally involved in the ordering of creation, in the representation of God, in the establishment of his rule. And so when we're not doing that, then creation suffers. And you can see clearly that that's a big deal because Paul talks about it in Romans 8 when he's saying, hey, like creation's like waiting for us <laughs> to get back on the bus, to get back on the train. Come on, you can do it. And, you know, that's a big part of it. And so Matthew Bates talks about in th that in the gospel precisely, which he put out a few years ago. And then he actually has an, a, a book that he newly launched called Why the Gospel. I'm about halfway through that now. I'm, I'm a little behind. But that's just launched this week. I would definitely recommend picking that up. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And he and, and Carmen Imes are a lot on the same page when it comes to that glory language, imaging language, and the connectivity there. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't recommend their work more. So everybody should be reading Matthew Bates' new book, which is called Why the Gospel, Living the Good News of King Jesus with a Purpose, uh, and also Carmen Iams book, which is just coming out, called Being God's Image, Why Creation Still Matters. And I will be putting links to both of those in my show notes for everyone. And of course, we also have to, to link McDowell's book because we're going to talk about it too. <laughs> right. Yeah, we're going to be getting into Catherine McDowell's book, which is The Image of God in the Garden of Eden. That one is a little more scholarly. I, I wouldn't say it's hard to read, but it's got footnotes and it's got transliteration of language, which might be a little bit daunting for some people. But if you want to get into the ancient Near Eastern context of The Image of God, there's just not a better book that you can get that will summarize a lot of that for you and really give you a lot of detail. So th that's what we're going to get into now. We're going to start talking about her work and how this plays in some of the things it points out. Obviously, some of the things that we talk about, the connections we make may or not be connections that she would make or endorse. So, you know, 
this is what happens. You put out scholarship and then people look at it and they see connections and they want to talk about it. So we're going to do that. And I think it'll be really good. So essentially what I want to explore today is looking at details in scripture that highlight the failure of both Jew and Gentile to bring glory to God by acting properly as his imagers. And I want to explore these motifs that highlight places where we're being told that an individual person or a leader or a whole nation seems to be becoming more or less able or doing better or doing worse at fulfilling the purpose that God created humanity for. So we talked last time about some of the parallels that we see in Genesis about how Israel's neighbors understood idolatry. And we highlighted the ways that imposter gods attempted to use the knowledge of the heavens and the earth to make children imagers of their own. And so today I want to look a little bit more at that detail and then start to kind of say, where do we see this in scripture? And does it seem to fit this pattern of, oh, this is scripture pointing out through this cultural lens that this person is in a better place or a worse place to do what they were created to do in the first place. So looking at McDowell on page 115, she has a really good brief kind of summary of two different things. So image of God in the Garden of Eden is comparing Genesis 2.5 through 3.24 with the Mesopotamian mispi pitpi ritual, which is the opening of the mouth, and the, I don't even know how to pronounce it, whippeter, <laughs> WBT-R, rituals in ancient Egypt. So these are the ceremonies that the Mesopotamians had to vivify idols, and then the ceremony that the Egyptians had to basically vivify the dead in their minds is what they were trying to do. And there's a lot of similarities there in what they were doing in general. Many differences, but again, similarities. So this is from McDowell. She says, the statue, the idol, is both born and manufactured, quote unquote, in heaven in this way of thinking. I noted a similar emphasis in the Egyptian opening of the mouth ritual. Despite its differences with the Miss P. Pit P., there are at least three striking parallels between the two sets of ritual texts. The rituals were performed in comparable sacred spaces, either in a temple workshop, in a sacred garden, or in a temple tomb. They exhibited a similar overall pattern of creation, animation, feeding, clothing, and installation, and they presented the creation of a divine image in terms of both birth and manufacture. In both cases, the statue was considered fully functioning, living manifestation of the divine only after undergoing the opening of the mouth, and in the case of Mesopotamia, first the washing of the mouth. So to step back and just kind of summarize, what you had was ceremonies where you had priests that would do things with idols, and, the, and there were a lot of common threats, right? We actually have different records of rituals, even from Mesopotamia and from Egypt. And then when you compare the two, there are differences there too. But some of the common threads you see are things like it's the idol is going to be constructed. The idol is going to be put into this chamber that has water and different spices and things to purify it and to signify birth. And there are incantations that are, are, are called down, and they believe that this is the moment that is birthed from the heavens. This is now a child of God, right? But it still needs to, there are other things that need to happen as well. So you have things like, well, this idol needs to be able to accept sacrifice, right? So what does it need to do? It needs to be able to eat. So we got to do something to make sure its mouth is open, right? It needs to be able to see so it can actually see what's going on in the world and respond to things. It needs to hear so we can pray to it. It needs to smell so that it can, it can take in the incense, right? We're vivifying the limbs and the body so that God can do things in this, uh, this sense of embodiment. These are the kinds of ideas that they had going around in their heads. And these took place in things like a garden in a grove of trees, Right. There are obvious connections to what we see in Genesis once we start to really look for it. And we're just going to kind of look at some of those, and then we're going to carry some of them through Scripture. Again, we're not saying, let's take a bunch of pagan ideas and then interpret the Bible through that. The way that we're looking at this is, these are pagan attempts to do what only God can do, that are connecting into the way that creation works, and saying, God can create life, and we envy that. So... As a lesser spiritual being, what can I do to possibly try to manipulate things in order to maybe kind of do something that resembles what God did? Apparently, I can make a dead idol that doesn't do anything. <laughs> but, you know, maybe there are things that can be done that, where then I interact a bit more with the people that worship me and, and convince them of certain things. And so it's all built around deception. It's built around imitation, right? But the details make sense because we're talking about something, someone 
a spiritual being trying to imitate God and trying to bring something to life. And life has a lot of characteristics that are pretty common. We need to be able to see. We need to be able to eat. We need to be able to, to move and live and like and breathe and all these things. That's part of being living, right? So the parallels here are not, you know, because Israel decided to imitate a bunch of pagans. It's because paganism is imitating life. Paganism is imitating what God actually did in creation. And that's what we see over and over. So when we have people who go, why are there similarities? That must mean the Bible is not true. I can't really trust it anymore. How am I supposed to think about that? Well, you think about it from the context of how you've thought about scripture all along, if you've been a believer and that's how you've been reading scripture. The fact that scripture is the truth and the false gods and the false religions are trying to riff off of that, basically. And just because we see those first in history on some chronology that we've come up with, well, first of all, as Dr. Heiser would say, that it was just such a quagmire. Like, you can't even get into that so much. But there are things you can say. And yes, things did come before the Bible because Israel actually had a history in time. But that doesn't mean that that's how God works. He transcends time and spiritual beings also are not bound by the confines of time here on earth. So there's lots of different ways we can think about that. So if we get into Genesis and we start reading from Genesis 2 and 3, there are things that just kind of pop out. So I'm just going to highlight a few of those and then we'll start to say, okay, well, do we see things that are similar in other places? And what might it be trying to tell us? But you have verse seven, two, seven, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So this idea of the breath of heaven entering this vessel made of earth, what does that sound like? It's, it sounds like paganism is trying to imitate that. And yet they can't. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the East in Eden. And there he put the man that he had formed. So now you, you also have part of the ceremonies would be installing a divine image or an idol into the temple that it was going to be in where it would receive worship. Different with Eden, because we're not talking about Adam and Eve receiving worship. That is due to God alone. But you still have the idea of placing the divine image into the garden, into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, if you will, if you understand Eden in that way, because all of the cosmos is a temple in certain ways of looking at things. And of course, in Genesis, we have the massive theme of trees and yes. eating from trees. So that it's like, well, hey, why was it a tree that they ate from? Why was that the first sin? Well, you really have to dig into this perspective of what it meant to be the image of God in God's holy place. And the food of the gods or the food of the kings and the food of royalty, you know, there, there were certain ways that they ate and commoners weren't going to go into the royal garden and eat from those trees, right? But I mean, you also have this idea that the partaking of the tree, in some sense, what you have is the Nakash, the serpent, offering food to Eve. This is in some way table fellowship between the human and the divine in a bad way. What I think, if you look at the whole breadth of scripture and really kind of understand how things fit together, what I think we're supposed to understand there is that that tree is something that eventually, when Adam and Eve were mature, God would have said, okay, now it's time for you to partake of this. It's time for you to understand this. It's time for you to have knowledge of this. We're going to do this together so that we can do it the right way. And that would involve communion with God, and it would involve being obedient to God in ways that the way they actually partook were not. Uh, I was reading Leviticus not too long ago, and I came up, I, I wish I had written down this reference, but I don't have it in front of me. But there's a part that talks about the maturing of the trees in the land that they're going into. And Leviticus is, of course, very steeped in the sacred space imagery. So this idea of maturing trees needing time in order to be available mm. for human food is a very biblical idea. <laughs> that just reminds me of, of tree beard, you know, like the fact that you know, <laughs> it, we only we don't say much in old Entish because it takes a very long time to say, or so, you know, something like that. And then the other thing of like, well, that doesn't make much sense. But then again, you are very small. <laughs>
But we do. We, we, we have this idea, right? We have the story in Genesis that Adam and Eve then partook of the tree, ate of something in a temple garden, which has a lot of parallels, again, to what we see with these different pagan circles trying to vivify idols. They would place the idol in the garden. They would open the mouth. They would do all these different things. And then there's a point where they would feed them. And their sensory organs, their eyes and ears were understood basically not to function at all until birth, until this kind of heavenly birth. That's kind of how they understood it. And so you have this connection between eating and having your eyes opened. And you kind of go, oh, like, yeah, mm, there's a lot of connectivity here. <laughs> We're not just cherry picking a few things. Yeah. It's, it's very, 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 very connected. And the serpent plays off of this. And he says, you know, you, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, part of that does work. Like, you know, later on, you you have this idea like, no, really, they, they, they know good and evil. So that part of it worked. But the problem is now they're corrupt. <laughs> right. And so God exiles humanity from the garden to keep them from becoming immortal, breaking in the tree of life, becoming immortal in a corrupt state. Because it wasn't God who yes. opened their eyes. One of the things that I think is really interesting is that in this framework, all of these different things that were done are kind of meant and the order can be different and there are different ideas about it and whatever. But but the, the whole idea with all of these ceremonies was that doing these things would move you closer to then having a fully functioning idol that you would put in the temple and that you could offer sacrifices to. And so if we parallel that and we think about it, it's like, oh, like... These are st steps that it seems like are taken, s at least symbolically, to say that humanity is becoming more like or more able to or less able to actually function the way they were originally designed as imagers of God. This idea that they partook of the food, which is a step forward, and their eyes were opened, which is a step forward, but then it's like bad, <laughs> right? not even like it's going in the wrong direction. It's like maturing in the wrong direction. So we see them partake of the fruit and their eyes are open. And what happens next? Not only are their eyes opened, but they realize they're naked. And of course, we have all kinds of compunctions about nudity in the United States. So our minds certainly go certain places and we get all uncomfortable in church pews and whatever. But I mean, there's some kind of obvious stuff with this, right? We, we often correlate things like recognizing that with a, a point of maturity. We also, I think through this other framework can say, one of the things you're supposed to do if you're trying to progress a divine image into the proper place of being able to fulfill its function is to clothe it properly. I think what we see here may be one of those things of it's like culturally telling the readers of Genesis their eyes are open, that's a step forward, right? After they ate, that's a step forward. But now they realize, oh no, there's a problem. They're actually not prepared for the space that they've now entered into. Mm. And they did it the wrong way. Uh -huh. And and they're gonna have all of this kind of compounding mm. sense of like, oh no. Like <laughs> right? and, and you see that, right? Because they try to make coverings for themselves. They're like, well, I guess we'll just clothe ourselves because oh, you know, eating of the fruit and getting our eyes open works. Maybe we can progress mm. and become more capable of doing this ourselves if we just take the steps, right? So in a sense, this is almost them trying to act like the pagans. We're just going to do the steps yeah. and we're going to hope it works. Yeah. We don't need God. <laughs> and, and the funny thing about this is you read a little bit further, right? They make covering for themselves, right? Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God, and God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit, the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said, what is this you have done, right? So you have this whole whole exchange and you kind of get to the point of just like, who told you you were naked? Like, it, it's almost like they covered themselves, but that covering doesn't work, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> 
and and so you do get the sense of like now we're really off into this territory of we're trying to do it ourselves we're trying to be all we can be and it's not working and it's bad and then you get into this you know god cursing the serpent god telling the woman and the man what life is going to be like for them god cursing the ground because of them so you have all of that happening and then you have god making garments of skin for them so what is he doing he's clothing them He's moving them forward in progression, even though they're off in the wrong direction. There's almost a sense in which God is basically saying, I designed you to image me in this way. That isn't possible right now where you're at, but I'm still going to carry forward your purpose of imaging me, even in this other mode, even in this other way. And we'll get back to the original purpose because I'm not done yet. And what's interesting is that we see that Adam does hear God. Oh. So that might be the one thing that's kind of working. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. That's great. So God's like, okay, so you can hear me. All right. This is what we're going to do now. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Again, like all the... A lot, once you see this stuff, it becomes so obvious because it pops out everywhere and then you see it everywhere. And yeah, I do have to take a step back and say, am I just reading this into things? Right. And sometimes we are. Uh, right. But we also don't have to say this is the meaning. We don't need to come at passages mm-hmm. that way. We can see layers of meaning and we can understand that there are different things we're meant to see from different angles and it's OK. So. Well, and and the thing is, you, you want to find multiple points of coherence yes. instead of just one word or just one thing that is showing up. But if you see several of these layers, then it's much more likely that you're yeah, on to something. Absolutely. So let's let's look at some examples of people becoming more or less able in Scripture using these kinds of details as hints to kind of point that out. Or to reinforce it, because really, if you're reading the surface text, it's pretty obvious, but you may not really connect it to the image of God. You're just going to say, that was bad. (laughs) Right? It's like, well, actually, no, it it was bad, but it's also bad in a specific way, because this is them not fulfilling the purpose they were created for. Uh, So first of all, a good example, right? You have Moses when he's up and he's in the presence of God on Mount Sinai, and he comes down, his face is radiant. So there's glory kind of streaming forth, if you will. That is him, in a way, acting more like an image is supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. But then we also have another example with Moses, and this is in the, in the other direction, right? So this is looking at Exodus 4. Moses is basically said, like, God is telling him, here's all the stuff you're going to do, and you can do signs, and you can do all these things, and you're going to go tell Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's going to do this, and blah, blah, blah. And Moses is like, you know, raising his hand, like, pardon your servant, Lord. (laughs) I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue, right? So he comes in with that kind of thing, and like, I I don't know, man. And you you have the sense of, of Moses basically saying, like, I'm not really that good at being an image to someone else, right? Mm, and God right. comes back and he says, you know, who gave human beings their mouths? Who, who makes the people deaf or mute? Who gives the sight or makes people blind? Is it not me? Now go and I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. And Moses is like, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Right. So this it's not even Moses not being able to do the thing. It's that he doesn't want to function in this way. He doesn't want to do this. And and then you have the Lord's anger burning against Moses. And he says, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him but take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. And you kind of have this almost like God and prophet relationship set up there. But another way you can look at it is image of God and prophet or image of God and priest. And this idea that like those are meant to be the same thing, but now they're kind of bifurcated because Moses is refusing to do his job. Listening to the Naked Bible podcast during the Exodus series, Dr. Heiser brought out these points that there's the possibility of, you know, Moses was supposed to be 
all three offices. He was supposed to be the priest and the king and the prophet, but Moses kept dropping the ball over and over and over. And so God said, okay, fine, we'll split all of these up. I'm still getting my purposes. I'm still getting my imagers accomplishing my representation. They're just going to have to do it in a collective way instead of each one being each of the offices. And I, I definitely think that's in play. I think that's another one of those kind of steps of and then not doing it. And so, and you see God putting things in place to be like, okay, well, that failed, right? And it's not that God is bad at things, but it's like, it's illustrating the fact that like, this is, this is the extent to which people with freedom can screw things up. And yet God still, if we read the whole story of scripture, still bringing things back to the beginning and actually better, (laughs) right? And I think it's really helpful to see scripture in these lights because we tend to read it and think, well, this is the way God wanted it all along because this is what happened. Therefore, obviously, this was God's will. I mean, to the end, it is God's will. God is kind of pushing the cue balls this way and that way in order to get stubborn humanity to God's purposes. But we're not foiling his purposes. Nothing is stopping God. But God's just like, okay, we could do this the easy way or we could do this the hard way. Which way do you guys well, want to do and it? I think we get hung up on that because our perspective is bound in time. Our perspective is in the moment. Yeah. And God's perspective is eternal. So from the perspective of God, you know, he declared the end from the beginning and they're going to end up that way. And we're just in this very tiny blip in the middle. <laughs> And and there were some issues because God chose to give people freedom because freedom is one of those things that you kind of need if you want to have relationship that involves love and, and all of those kinds of things. And it's important. And so he did. And here we are. And then blip. And then, oh, look, God accomplished his plan. Like from an eternal perspective, that's what it looks like. Mm-hmm. We're just, we're on the other side of it. We can't right. see that. And we're, we're just the stubborn people who want to to do it our own way. And God keeps saying, okay, well, you can, and my purposes are still going to get accomplished. So it's just going to be more interesting or some other (laughs) adjective like that. Oh yeah. So another one of these moments, I don't know. Do you, do you want to talk about the adornment? Yeah, this one's fascinating. This is one that I think that is not something that we pay a whole lot of attention to, especially these days. You know, we tend to have this really strange relationship with fashion and how we dress and what that actually means. And well, why were Adam and Eve naked and now they're not naked? And well, are we supposed to be naked? And, you know, all of those kinds of crazy kinds of things that we attach because we have certain meanings that we attach to it. And those meanings are not necessarily the same meanings that the ancient person would have had. Like we keep bringing up Carmen Imes' name, but we're going to bring it up again because she has her book bearing God's name. And that is very connected to this adornment idea as well. So if you haven't read that book, highly recommend it. All right, so it is Exodus that we see this idea of adornment really brought out forth because we have the concept of the people leaving Egypt and they don't leave Egypt empty-handed. In Exodus 12:35 it says the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. So it's the pagan god worshipers who are giving the Israelites their gold and their silver, and also not just gold and silver, but clothing. It's This isn't yeah. a fashion thing. <laughs> well, and, and it goes beyond that, you know, leaving with livestock so they can make sacrifices to God. But you also have yeah. this idea through this framework saying, it seems like this is a step towards the people of Israel being able to function properly as divine images. Oh, this is a step in the right direction. This is good. Yeah. And because again, our modern perspectives are putting meaning into the text for all of these things. And our meanings are not necessarily lined up with what the ancient person would be thinking of in the same context. And so if we take this, right, and we say, what if, what if this is pointing out 
that they've now moved more in the direction of being able to fulfill the purpose God created humanity for. If we move that forward into Exodus 32, then we have the incident with the golden calf. And this is really interesting because this gets straight into the way that, that Paul talks about exchanging the image, exchanging the glory of God for these images of, of creation, right? You literally have the people saying like, Aaron, our priest, like not only is it just somebody, but it's like, let's ask the priest because that's the best person to corrupt, right? So you have this idea of like asking the person that's probably most in the place of functioning properly is an image of God. If you, you know, in terms of priesthood, that idea is there. And they're saying, you know, come make us gods, right? Make us these, these gods that brought us out of Egypt. And so Aaron answers them and he says, take off the golden earrings that you are wearing. So take off the things you got from the Egyptians. Unadorn yourselves. You're now basically becoming less able to properly worship God and properly image God because you're doing this. And they do it. They take them off. He melts them down. He makes the golden calf. He says, these are your gods. And then when Moses comes down, you also have this point where he gets really mad. He burns it with fire. He grinds it into a powder, scatters it on the water, and he makes them drink it. So now you have a connectivity between this idea of adornment and imaging language. You have this connection in with idolatry and causing problems with properly imaging God. And you also have this connectivity into themes later on, like in Numbers, where you see a description of the test for adultery. And the test for adultery is like, we're just going to put some dirt in this water and the woman's going to drink it. And if if she's guilty, then like bad things happen, right? You have that kind of motif here with Moses basically saying like, okay, Israel, like <laughs> here's what you wanted. So drink it and let's see what happens. And that is another theme that carries forward into it. This idea that idolatry and adultery are almost connected because you have these themes of Israel being the bride of God. It's just this waveform that they keep moving up, getting a little bit closer, and then putting themselves back down into the pit, and then getting up, and God's like, okay. And I wonder if that the act of having them drink it is is maybe connected to some internalization mm. idea of like, okay, you guys were adorned like an idol, like like a proper image. You threw all of that away in order to make something that you weren't supposed to do. So here, let's let's try and get you to really... We're going to make it part of who you are because you are what you eat, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. There was the eating of the tree, and now here we are at the next level like of, mm. of what's going on here. It just seems to be more of this idea of escalation mm -hmm. that we keep seeing going That's through good. scripture. Another connectivity that we have, and I'm going to see if I can find this actually, but there, there's a place in McDowell's book where she talks about the fact that the statue, like the idol that people have, specifically talks about the fact that the adornment is for splendor and glory. And then you have in Exodus 28, this description of the clothing that is to be made for the high priest and for the priests. 28 verse 1, I have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, so they may serve as priests. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor, right? And so you, you have this almost direct connection of the kinds of things they dressed the priest in and the kinds of things the Canaanites dressed their idols in are basically the same. <laughs> You know, which again, it kind of has that yeah, connection, right. but also the reinforcement of like, I am a living image of the living God and you are just imitation. And it's easy to just say, well, that was just the high priest. That's another thing that I think that Dr. Heiser brought up in his Exodus series is the people rejected being priests. They said, no, 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 never mind. Just have one person and that one person can be in the danger zone. We don't really want that. <laughs> yeah send moses up the mountain we're not really into that yeah we're not cool with that so but yeah for me for me that part of what that connects into is this uh, again you have a sense of god saying like okay you guys don't seem to get it that's okay 
You're a little slow. We'll take it slow. I'm going to establish an office of the priesthood. And that office of the priesthood is going to be one of the ways that somebody most directly acts the way you're supposed to as an image of God. And that's going to have an impact, right? So again, you see God kind of moving things forward. And yet, even with those institutions, even with the things God does to make this available to people, you see the continual failure of people. And it's almost like they're setting up for something. <laughs> but let's let's talk a little bit more about idols, I guess, and then idolatry, and then we can get into some of the other places some of the stuff pops out. I mean, we've kind of jumped around a bit here and there, but I think that everyone can kind of follow the trail we're leaving. And, and it's it's starting... Well, when I first started looking at this, it was like, okay, yes, I see this connection point and I see this connection point and I see this connection point. And then I left it for a while and I said, well, that's really cool. And that's really, really important. And I understood that it was Mm -hmm. all through scripture, but it wasn't until you really dig into the details of exactly what seeing means in scripture and exactly what hearing means in scripture and exactly how those kinds of things interplay into things because you know it's easy oh yeah well of course you have to see and you have to hear in order to do anything or to understand scripture or to to hear the the leaders of the israelites but once you see that that is idolatry language and that is connected to genesis in the garden and Exodus and Mount Sinai and the entry into the promise that all of those things, like there's this thread that you can just follow all through. It's, it's crazy. In first Samuel 12, 21, it says, do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. And I I find that repetition of the word useless quite interesting there. (laughs) It's probably on purpose. (laughs) Right. Hmm. Is there a useful idol then? It's like we we tend to look at that kind of language and we go, oh, well, that just means that idols are nothing and that anything about an idol is completely useless. We're, We're missing that subtext that's going to be there when the ancient person hears or reads that. And part of that is they're useless because they're an idol of a God that is not the most high and what he wants to happen is going to happen no matter what they have to say about it. Right. So you have some of that comparative stuff going on, but they're also useless in the sense that they can't accomplish the purpose that divine images were created for in the first place because they're not human and you have to be human and humans are created to image the most high and they're not made to image the most high. Like there's all of those layers of this being a failure to actually accomplish Mm -hmm. the task. So they're useless in the ultimate sense of the word. They genuinely cannot walk. They genuinely cannot eat. They genuinely cannot hear or see. The people who would make the idols and who would use the idols, this is how they would interact with their gods, right? And they would hope that something was going on, but they didn't really Mm -hmm. know if the God was there, if the God was happy with them, they wouldn't know that until what they wanted to happen would happen. Then they would say, Oh, look, look at that. We did make the God happy. Let's do that again. And and if you want to get into a fun critique of this whole idea, diving a little bit into the Septuagint and reading bell and the dragon is a fun little kind of anecdotal thing of like, Mm. no, really it's not that the gods are eating the offerings you put before them. The priests are lying to you. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, we have this, in, and you see it in, in Habakkuk 2.18, Jeremiah 10.14, Leviticus 26.30, Deuteronomy 32.21, a whole bunch of other passages. This idea that idols are worthless, they are useless, they don't function properly, they can't do the job that humans were created to do. They're blind, they're deaf, they're dumb, they can't walk, someone has to carry them, like <laughs> all of these different things, right? And then you get into the connection that we talked about last time with the fact that those who make idols and those who worship idols become like the idols, right? So all who make idols are nothing, and the things that they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame, Isaiah 44, 9. Second Kings 17, 15. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. It's like we're seeing a pattern, right? 
Jeremiah 2.11, has a nation ever changed its gods, yet, yet they are not gods at all? But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Does that not sound like Romans 1? <laughs> so now you even have what Paul is posing mostly as a critique, I think, of Gentiles in chapter 1, and then turning it onto the Jews in chapter 2. You also have things in, in the Old Testament that kind of make it clear, like, that distinction there between people having a problem with idolatry is not as clear as you think. <laughs> well, and people turn to these kinds of passages all the time, and they say, well, that just means that the gods aren't real because these are only blocks of wood. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and and God really had a party. Yahweh really had a party when he stomped on the on the wooden blocks in, in, in Egypt, right? <laughs> I'm going to judge those wooden blocks. Judge them real good. In the the second Kings passage that you read, it says they followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. So they're making a connection between the idol and the idol maker and how those are worthless, but why are they worthless? Are they, is it because they don't exist or is it because they're not functioning because they're not actually doing what they claimed to do to begin with? And they're certainly not doing what an, a real idol ought to do that God would be putting forth. Yes. And you see how relationally this causes problems. So in Jonah 2.8, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Like How, how direct can you get, right? Yeah. Um, Ezekiel 6.9 then makes these connections between, you know, connections with lusting after their idols, right? So now you have, again, that kind of adultery language and, and idolatry con connected together. And, and there are many, many more passages. So you see it in the Psalms, you see it in the prophets, especially. But, you know, you can even go beyond there and see bits and pieces of it. So we can also look at specific abilities, if you will, and just kind of say, okay, so if there's a general pattern, do we see even more specific things that, that start to kind of illustrate this, right? So let's take the, the instance of sight. So in Isaiah 56.10, it says, Israel's watchmen are blind. They all lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. That's got some really good imagery in it. <laughs> <laughs> right? And um, it has consequences, right? Because we're mm -hmm. talking about the watchmen. Yeah. Right? So th these are the people that are supposed to be keeping guard and then letting people know if trouble is approaching. And they're like a dog that can't bark. Oh, shoot. Do we know trouble is approaching? Can't tell. My dog doesn't bark. <laughs> like, that's not good. And I love that this passage is bringing up the idea of sleeping because that is quite an interesting image as well. If you wanted to trace that through scripture, we have Adam who was asleep when Eve was brought out and, you know, just on and on from there. But that's one I haven't traced yet. So more homework. <laughs> Everyone gets homework this time. In John 12, 40, it says, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. And that one seems pretty harsh. Yeah, yeah. But it, you put that in perspective, and I think what we see there is essentially what Paul is describing in Romans, where he's talking about a partial hardening coming upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, right? So if you're going to have a crucified Messiah, you need to have people that yell crucify. If you're going to have the gospel go out to all the nations, you you kind of almost have to have some level of rejection in the synagogues that Paul faced in order for it to get to the Gentiles, because getting into the Gentiles is kind of the last thing on most people's minds among the Jews, right? So right. you have this kind of pressure pushing everything out, and this this blinding that you hear, it's God doing something in order to make all of that possible. Right. Then, of course, you also have 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, which talks about the God of this age blinding the minds of unbelievers, right? So you can look at this and you can say, is it God using the devil to do the blinding that was talked about in John 12, or are these two different kinds of things? I think maybe in this case, we might be talking about unbelievers amongst the Gentiles in 2 Corinthians, since that's more of their context. But even there, you have this idea of blinding the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel 
that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, <laughs> right? And it's not just so that they can't see him, but it, it's again kind of pointing out like Christ is the image that's functioning. He's the one that's truly doing all of this. And the unbelievers are blind to it. A lot of people from within Israel are blind to it. They are not functioning properly. And so Christ needs to come in order to enable that to happen. Mm -hmm. The connection of sight and blindness and light and glory, that, that just, I don't know, it's just one of those themes that really appeals to me because it's so primal. And I think maybe for us today, we have a harder time understanding that. It's like, well, we have light around us all the time if we want even when we go out at night here in the world, it's much brighter than it would have been for the ancient person for most of us because of all the ambient light and everything else. One of the other connections we then see is you look at Matthew 15, where Jesus' disciples come to him and they're like, do you, do you know that you made the Pharisees mad? Like, this is bad, right? They're kind of freaking out. And and Jesus just says, you know, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And we viscerally know what that means when we think about the blind leading the blind kind of visually in our imagination. We can see it in terms of understanding the truth. And so you don't want to follow somebody that doesn't have the truth. But I do think there's another layer you can look at this at and basically say, like, if someone is not in a place where they're imaging God well, why would you follow them? Because they're not going to help you to do that. And that's what you were made to do. <laughs> you know, like it's kind of a big deal. It gets more into this question of, do I follow the teacher that quote unquote is very biblical and really, you know, toes the line and whatever, but that's also just a jerk. Mm. Right? Yeah. What are they doing? Yeah. Are, are they representing God well? I'm not sure. In a lot of cases, I'd probably say no. Right. So what do you do with that? I think we tend to disregard the impact that other people have on us when we surround ourselves with the people that we surround ourselves with. So, you know, this is talking directly about the Jewish leaders or the people who want to be seen as the leaders, the people of high prominence in Jewish society, this is very insulting to them. And this tells where they're going to ultimately end up and where their followers are going to end up if they keep going down those paths. Yeah. And the connection with Saul and in Acts 9. This one is cool on like three different levels. Yeah. This one has so much into it and it's just, it's just packed. I'm just going to read, starting in verse 8. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they, led him by the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. It fascinates me that we have the issue of the eyes, then we have baptism, then we have the eating of food after that. Mm -hmm. And only then did he regain his strength. Yeah. He sent me so that you may see again, right? So God is going to enable you to properly function as an imager and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, gee, I mean, talk about embodiment of God. <laughs> That's kind of a big deal, right? And then you also have, you know, immediately something like scales. It's, it's not just that his eyes are opened, right? Because they could have just said, and then his eyes were opened. And that would already come loaded with a whole bunch of stuff. But you have something like scales falling from his eyes. That brings back serpent imagery. Mm -hmm. So now you almost have this sense of, and now this one who was unable to properly image God because of the way that he was understanding things, that he was persecuting the church, he was doing these things. 
even to the point of basically doing the deeds of the devil, of the serpent, right? Which which comes with that connotation of of being a child of the devil by virtue of what you're doing, right? Now this person even has been brought back to right. This person has been brought back to now he's going to be functioning well as an image of God because he's beheld Christ, because he is now acting in fealty to Christ, the perfect image of God. And God could have restored his sight just by a random miracle, but Mm -hmm. he sent someone to do this to Saul, to participate in Mm -hmm. the scales falling from his eyes and his ability to be able to see. And I, I think that speaks a lot about the discipleship walk of people and the interconnectedness of the body of Christ and what that means as far as being the image. Mm -hmm. We're not just imaging God. There's an image over there and there's an image over there and we're all just kind of doing our thing separately. No, we're a very cohesive group that should be working on this and doing things together. A lot of the rest of this stuff, as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking about hearing. I'm thinking about seeing and perceiving we just we have more of these layers that you get into that's just like god basically saying israel much of israel at least has failed at the purpose that they were brought together for because they are still blind and deaf they are still dumb they are still lacking understanding and perception these are all things they're supposed to have if they're going to properly function as the image of god collectively individually, right? And so we see things like Isaiah 42, 18 and 19. We see Matthew 11, 5, Isaiah 6, 9, Matthew 13, 13 through 14, all of these kinds of things, right? And then you get into the contrast where instead of something like Matthew, you know, this is why I speak to them in parables, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving, much like the idols that you went after. And that's why you went into exile, right? All of it being connected. You then have the flip side, right? When Jesus arrives and you have Isaiah eleven two talking about the spirit of God resting on the Messiah, the one who is to come, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Oh, what is that? That's imaging language, right? The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Oh, he's, he has understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, right? So you have Jesus who is embodying now what it's supposed to be the image of God. You also have Jesus reading from the scroll and basically saying like, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and I'm going to preach good news to the poor and the recovery of sight to the blind and raising the dead. Like all of these things are bringing people back into what they are supposed to be as people, as imagers. And you even get to the point where you start going like, wait a minute, Jesus healing ministry feels like it has overtones of this because you have in Luke 7, 21 and 22, At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. Oh, it's like, maybe maybe there is a a layer of this that's saying, and he is going to enable them to be what they were designed to be in the first place, right? So he replied to the messengers. This is when messengers are sent from John the Baptist to Jesus to basically say, are you who you say you are? And he's like, you know, yes, I am. I've been doing these things. Go back and report to John what you have seen. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those of leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. All of these things are connected into imaging properly, at least when we get into what it means to image in the sense also of exercising rule and justice. I knew you were going to say justice. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It mentions the poor and... Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, we're going to have a justice series, and that's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yeah, no, I mean, that, that'll that be really good. That'll be really good. There's just so much to see here and to dig into. And like Tim Mackey says, it's, this is Jewish meditation literature, and you can just pour through it and pour through it and see so many things. Well, and if we want to give a few more rabbit trails for people to go look for, right? Homework. 
Yeah. I started thinking about Jesus, the body of Christ, new birth, right? John 1, John 3. Start thinking about new covenant, Ezekiel 36, 37, and Jeremiah 31. Moses and Aaron, right, which we actually did talk about, God opening Lydia's heart and opening her understanding so that she could receive the truth. What it means to truly image a God who gave up himself when Paul is talking about us being living sacrifices in Romans, like start to just kind of look at some of these layers and these things and see, you know, oh, does this connect into anything that that's connected into imaging language? Does it connect into seeing? Does it connect into being able to speak? Does it connect into being able to walk? Does it connect into glory? Does it connect into splendor? Does like ask these questions and see what pops out to you? Because more often than not, you're going to find something where you go like, Ooh, that's, Oh, that's cool. (laughs) Yeah, because it's more than just the themes that keep showing up. It's the themes that intersect with the people's lives who are living these things out in Scripture. So when you see these themes connected to to actual people and actual stories in the Bible, then you're going to be able to draw out nuance from those stories and meaning from those stories because of how those people act, whether or not they are acting in the way that God would have them act or whether they're acting in the way that the serpent would have them act or, you know, whatever. So uh, I, I think that it's more than just word studies. It's more than just noticing these cool patterns and these cool things is actually looking at people's lives because what we see in scripture is these patterns that happen over and over and a lot of it's escalation and a lot of it is restitution sometimes as well and seeing how restitution also happens through the work of the prophets or through the work of Christ can help lead us on our own discipleship walks in understanding how we should be embodying the image and how we can be interacting with the body of Christ and outside of the body of Christ to bring people into it. Yes. And really a lot of what we're doing here is looking in all these little details that pop up, right? And there's just little points of connectivity and you go, oh, that's interesting. That seems to connect in here. When you continue to do this and you keep looking into it and you keep digging into different layers of things, the more and more you look at it, the more you realize like, Most of the Bible is about this. (laughs) It's not just Genesis and a couple of verses where Paul uses image of God to describe Christ. This whole wrestling match, this whole back and forth, this whole tension of humanity stepping into and living into what we were created for and being pulled away from that by our own desires by the influences of false gods and of demons. Like all of that is part of the drama that's happening in scripture. And what God is doing is bringing things back to the point where we are properly functioning. That brings creation back to the point where it's supposed to be. This is all happening through Christ. And, you know, Paul comes right out and says this in Romans 8 like 18 through 21, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Hello, glory, image, language. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Oh, image, children, kinship. Hmm. That's all connected there too. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. All right. So end to end, we have this narrative thread. We have this motif that goes, and all the things we're picking at tonight as we're looking at details are just reinforcing the fact that this is a big deal. (laughs) (laughs) And for those not used to this kind of thing, this is what biblical theology is. (laughs) It's not just proof texting, it's tracing Mm -hmm. lines and themes and narratives, motifs. Right. And, And you can see that you can't just bundle all of this up into this single statement of here it is and that's all there is to it because... If you do that, you're missing out on a lot of the detail that is going to help you be a disciple and live out your life and see the good and the bad and the ugly and the beautiful and all of those things. Did you want to go ahead and end with the Psalm 82 thing? 
Yeah, why not? <laughs> so this is just cool because when you read something like Psalm 82 and you get into the debates about, you know, is this a divine council? Is this the council of judges? What is this, right? I think that a lot of what we've been talking about helps to really clarify what this psalm is. And there are layers that do kind of connect into both the heavenly and the earthly, but you can see pretty clearly some of the things that we've been talking about related to idolatry here, uh, when you know what the language to look for, to the imaging here, when you know what to look for, and to the expectation that we have for God arising and making things right. God presides in the great assembly in the divine council. He renders judgment among the gods. He says, how long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and of the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. The gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness, and therefore all the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, you are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. A lot of people have read that psalm over and over and over and never looked at it in terms of imaging language. And this is what we can do throughout Scripture again and again and again. So for those listening, that's your homework. (laughs) As you're reading, the more you look at this, the more you can really pull out these threads for yourself and see just how prevalent it is, just how important it is, just how embedded it is into God's purposes and how God wants to see the world be. This was a great conversation, Joshua. I really appreciate you coming and having it. And I don't think we're done yet, but <laughs> <laughs> but oh. this is just such such a rich topic that I think can really help us imagers. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it, it helps us to to see why idolatry is so bad. It helps us to see why sin is so terrible. It helps to see the impact that that has not only on ourselves but on the people around us, on creation. And it helps us to understand our need for Christ and helps us to appreciate what he has done and what he is doing to make all things right. So the more that we can explore that and understand it and put it in perspective, it helps when you're facing things and you're, you know, wow, I really want to do that particular sin that I like, or man, that person's just a jerk. I'm going to tell them they're a jerk instead of treating them like they are an imager of God, even if they're not acting like it. it. It really helps to put a lot of things in perspective to where I think we can better feel solid in our faith and we can better treat people as if we actually believe what we say we believe. Okay, we've really run over time here and we're going to stop the conversation, but we're not done yet. We will be back with some other conversations And I really highly recommend that everyone take some of these ideas that we have brought forward and look at some of these passages and do your own searches. And as you're reading scripture, see what you can find yourself, because this is not beyond the average Bible student to be understanding these passages on their own once they understand where all of this is coming from, the context of it, and the culture, and these ideas that all kind of combine to form the framework that we see the image of God in. So I hope this was all really helpful to you, and I hope you all enjoyed listening. If you have any questions about our series or about the image of God in general, we would love to hear them. So you can message me on Facebook. You can ask them in my Facebook discussion group. You can email me at genesismarksthespot at gmail.com. I would love to hear them. We would love to address them in a Q&A type of an episode or just in another conversation we're having. Again, I really appreciate everyone listening. I appreciate those who share these episodes and who have rated the podcast on the various platforms. I do have a YouTube channel as well where these are hosted. So if you like and subscribe there, 
and leave comments on the videos. That's really helpful to the algorithms and helpful to get other people to be able to find this content that might be helpful to them. I really hope you guys are enjoying this series. I know I am. I am learning a lot just in the conversations and in the research and in reading scripture myself and seeing these things laid out in front of me. Don't forget to ask questions. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to comment and come and participate in any way that you can, because we love having these conversations together. It's a really good group on Facebook, and we're getting some really good conversations going, and I appreciate everyone there who participates. I am as well trying to come up with some other ideas for people to help participate and help support me in what I'm doing because this does cost me money and it does take me a lot of time. So look forward to those kinds of things if you're interested. If not, you can just keep listening for free and that's fine too. Just sharing and commenting and doing all of those things is such an immense help to promote what I'm doing here. So I, I appreciate all of that and I thank each one of you for listening. Also, I thank Winter Gatan for the music, and I hope you all have a blessed week. See you later.